Hello guys, today I am going to talk you through anything you need to know to travel to Panama. When I was looking into backpacking Panama, I did not find the answers to my questions, so I hope in this video I can give you all the information that I was missing. I will be talking about the best time to go there, the entry and onward travel requirements, the itinerary and places you should be going when you are there, how to get around, where to stay, and last but not least, what it costs for you to travel all around Panama. I spent three weeks in Panama, so I would say I spent a good amount of time to take it all in and share with you all the knowledge that I gained along the way. Let's get started. The best time to travel to Panama is the dry season, which for the Panamanians is their summer. It begins in December and wraps up at the end of April. So April to December is actually the wet season. November would be the worst month to visit when it comes to rainfall. It is also a month that is full of national holidays, so many of the locals will be traveling around Panama as well, making it more expensive and a lot more busy. Seaside towns like Bocas del Toro and the San Blas Islands have their own kind of climates, so they have some scattered rainfall throughout the entire year. Same goes for the highlands of Panama like Boquete and Valle de Anton, there they also have more frequent rainfall, but it is never too bad. Entering Panama and onward travel were super easy. Most nationalities can travel to Panama and upon entry they will acquire a tourist visa and it doesn't require any actions before actually leaving. For example, I know how hard it is for South Africans to travel, but even Panama is super open towards South Africans. Now that you know when to go and how to get in, let's talk about where you're gonna be going. Most people arrive in Panama City and Panama City actually surprised me. It it was a surprisingly nice city with lots of skyscrapers, a beautiful skyline, a nice old city center, but it was quite dirty, like the waste management wasn't the best. Um, but other than that, I did have a great time in Panama City. If you will not be arriving in Panama City, you might be arriving from Colombia. A popular way to get from Colombia to Panama is through the San Blas Islands. You will go on a sailboat with a group of people and then cross the ocean, visit the islands, and that way you will then reach Panama City. What I did was take an excursion from Panama City to the San Blas Islands and back to Panama City, which was half the price and also saves you a very bumpy open sea ride. So arguably, I would say this is maybe even the better option. I loved my time in San Blas so much. I think to this day, it is one of my favorite places in the whole world and it's one of the best things I've done. I made a separate video about each experience. I'll be talking about every single place I've made a separate video about, so check them out if you want an in-depth guide to the separate destinations. So yeah, San Blas Islands, amazing. I made it back to Panama City and from there I had a bit of a dilemma. Either I could go to Valle de Anton, which is an old volcanic crater that is very known for hiking. I'm not much of a hiker personally and it was also quite a bit out of the way with public transportation. So I decided to go to the Pacific Coast instead. The first stop you will come by that is popular with backpackers is Playa Venao. I believe this is where the first ever Selena Hostel is located and it is very much a surf town and there is not that much else going on there. So I decided to skip that one and go straight to Santa Catalina and Santa Catalina is also a beautiful surf town, beautiful beaches, but it is also the gateway from where you can visit Coiba National Park. The Coiba Islands are seen as the Galapagos of Central America. Coiba Island itself is also the biggest island of Central America. I went diving there and I honestly lost track of the amount of sharks we saw rays. In the right season you can even see whale sharks and whales and so much more. It is honestly a stunning place and I'm really glad I last minute put it onto my itinerary. If you want to see what Coiba Island has to offer, you could also take a snorkeling trip where you also see turtles, sharks and everything. So it is definitely also worth the money or you can do even some overnight tours on the islands. From the local fisher town of Santa Catalina, I made my way north to Boquete. The most popular activity here once again is to go hiking. You can either walk to the hidden waterfalls or you can hike up the Baru volcano. This is one of the most popular volcanoes because once you reach the top, you can see both the Atlantic and the Pacific coast. You can literally see both sides of the continent of America. So that is really cool and very unique, but it requires a 10 hour hike, 5 hours up and 5 hours down and I was not up for that, I'm not gonna lie, um, it sounds absolutely brutal. You could also choose to spend some money to just get up there 
by 4x4. Some other popular activities in Boquete is going on a coffee tour to see where the famous Panamanian geisha coffee is made or grown. Or you can do a chocolate workshop in town. The Perfect Pair is a place where you can do chocolate workshops and friends of mine who did it, they got so much chocolate to take away. It looks like a good investment. The next stop will be one that's hard to leave and that is the Lost and Found Hostel. This one along with Boquete is up in the northern cloud forest in the La Fortuna National Park to be specific. It is one of the most unique experiences because you are literally staying at this hostel up in the cloud forest. There are a lot of unique experiences that you can do from the hostel, go horseback riding, do a cool treasure hunt. There is so much going on in this natural reserve that the hostel is located in. There is a family dinner every night, lots of hammocks to chill out in, and also a cool bar that you can hang out at in the evenings. It's a very social hostel and definitely one of the coolest ones I've stayed in in the entire world. The hostel itself is the destination here. And the best thing about it is that it is located on the way from Boquete or David to Pocas del Toro, the next destination. So there's no reason for you to skip it because it's literally on your way. So let's talk about Bocas del Toro, which is the final stop on the itinerary. And once again, one of my favorite ones. I love Panama so much uh, and I'm glad I got to spend three weeks there and one of those three weeks was in Bocas del Toro. This is an archipelago or a bunch of islands at the northernmost tip of the Caribbean coast of Panama. Here you will mainly get to spend your days enjoying the Caribbean islands, the most beautiful beaches. I love the Zapatilla Keys. It's a whole day trip that you do and they take you to the most stunning island. It was one of my favorite days unexpectedly because I got so much more than I signed up for. There is a floating bar, there is also Filthy Fridays which is a huge um, kind of bar hopping which all backpackers in the area attend. It's really a good time. But let's talk about transportation. How are you gonna get from point A to point B? Well there are two options. You can either take public transportation but the connections will not be direct so you will have to get a connection each time but at every stop there will be a local guiding you from one bus to your next they help you out so much to make sure that you get the right bus um, and you get the right connection in time or if you don't want the hassle of taking different buses then you can go for a shuttle the shuttles are more expensive the local buses are obviously the cheapest option but if you don't want the hassle then you can always take a shuttle a shuttle will take you from door to door and it does cost a bit more but it's very convenient i took local transportation most of the time except for santa catalina to boquete because there was just a bit too much hassle and anyway the other legs of the trip i did completely with public transportation and all of that you can also see in the separate videos each time i explain how i get to the place and then I continue the video. Along the way I stayed in hostels and I already told you about the Lost and Found hostel which is definitely my favorite one but the other most popular hostels each time are quite expensive. I always went onto my trusted hostel world app and I go and select best rated and then I look at the best rated ones and I take the one that according to me is the best value for money. Not necessarily the most popular one because oftentimes they were more than 20 euros per night and that is simply over my budget. And the good value for money ones each time were really good. I highly recommend using Hostel World to find a good hostel that is within your budget. All right, talking about budget, let's talk money. Let's get into what it costs on average per day to travel in Panama. In Panama, they pay with Balboas or US dollars. So if you get some US dollars from home, that's a good way to save on ATM fees because every time you take out cash it costs about five to six and a half dollars but card payments are accepted in most places as well when it comes to transportation I spent about six dollars per day so that includes the transportation from place A to place B but also sometimes a local bus etc or even a taxi boat my accommodation cost me fifteen dollars per night on average and it was quite a bit more expensive on Bocas del Toro when it comes to activities I spent about $28 per day 
and a lot of that probably comes from the diving that I did at the Koiba Islands. I spent $180 on the diving, I spent $300 on the sunblast tour, I did the zapatillas keys tour. So yeah, all of that will obviously crank up my daily budget. But when I save on anything else, experience is the least of my worries. Um, I just don't want to skimp out on experiences. For food, I spent about $13 per day. If you want to save money on food, then you can definitely buy lots of stuff at the grocery store and just prepare it at the hostel. Each hostel has a kitchen, often there's family dinners, etc. If you want to save some money when you're eating out, you can eat at the local fondas. And a fonda is a local restaurant that has like a cheap daily lunch option uh, or something like that. So that brought my total to $60 a day, which is quite a hefty price. But like I said, I've done so many incredible activities and it was worth it. But just know that you could probably get a really great experience for, I would say, maybe $50 per day already. Maybe even less uh, if you're not doing too many activities, you're just going surfing with your own surfboard or you just buy a surfboard and I mean, it's up to you. You could just spend time laying on beaches, surfing, and even the hiking doesn't cost you anything. So really what you choose to spend is up to you, but that is what I spent. Definitely bring Factor 50 sunscreen, especially for the islands. You will need it. I had Factor 30 with me and it just was not doing it. It was not cutting it. Also mosquito spray will be an important one, uh, but it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. If you want an overview of everything I have mentioned right now and all my recommendations of places to go, places to eat, then definitely check out the link in my description below because I have an entire guide that also has an interactive map with all the information on it. Anyway, I hope you found this guide useful and that it was helpful for planning your own trip. I hope you have the best of time just like I did. And if you did, then definitely give this video a like and subscribe if you want to see also my guide that I'll be doing about Costa Rica and backpacking Central America in general. And then I hope to see you in the next video. Bye!